Imagine being a young person, full of dreams and aspirations, suddenly faced with the weight of a lifetime behind bars. Well, brace yourself as we explore the profound impact that such a sentence can have on the lives of these teenagers as they come to terms with the consequences of their actions. From the courtroom drama to the aftermath of the sentencing, we witness the raw emotions, the disbelief, and the struggle to comprehend the gravity of their situations. Get ready for a thought-provoking and eye-opening journey into the world of teenagers reacting to life sentences. Dexter Johnson. Our story takes us back to the year 2007 in Houston, Texas. In a packed courtroom, the air was thick with tension as the fate of 19-year-old Dexter Johnson hung in the balance. Johnson, along with four accomplices, was found guilty of a heinous crime that shocked the community. It all began a year earlier when Johnson and his accomplices carjacked 23-year-old Maria Aparace and 17-year-old Hugh Ngo. After robbing the couple, they drove them to a secluded wooded area. Johnson committed a horrifying act. He raped Maria. Then, in a chilling display of cruelty. Johnson and one of his accomplices walked the couple deeper into the woods and executed them. The trial that followed was a harrowing experience for all involved. Now, in this pivotal moment, the jury had reached a verdict. The courtroom was filled with family members of both the defendant and the victims, their eyes fixed on the judge. Dexter Darnell Johnson, the jury has found you guilty of capital murder. In accordance with the laws of the state of Texas, this court hereby says it's your punishment of death. Following the jury's verdict, the courtroom erupted in a mix of shock, grief, and anger. Johnson's family, seated behind him, were clearly devastated by the verdict. Some could be heard weeping uncontrollably, while others sat in stunned silence. The victim's family, sitting on the opposite side, were equally overwhelmed by a flood of emotions. In the midst of the chaos, Johnson sprang from his seat, knocking over a computer monitor in his path. His desperation was palpable as he made a move towards the victim's family, trying to attack them. pandemonium took over the court, sending one attorney seeking refuge under the desk. Several officers rushed to surround Johnson, while others tried to keep the gallery at bay. By all indications, Johnson had not taken his death sentence nicely, hence the chaos that unfolded. The emotional turmoil even spilled out into the hallway, where the intensity of the situation was felt by all. One family member, overcome with grief and distress, required immediate medical attention. The impact of the life sentences on both the defendants and the victims' families is immeasurable. Daniel Bartelt. Next, we delve into the shocking case of Daniel Bartelt, a teenager whose life took a dark turn when he was sentenced to life in prison. It all began on July 15, 2013, when the life of 19-year-old Jesse Blodgett was brutally cut short. Jesse, a talented musician, was found dead inside her own home, sending shockwaves through her community. On that fateful day, a new student was to arrive at Blodgett's home for a piano lesson around 12.30 p.m. Little did anyone know that this seemingly ordinary day would end in tragedy. Blodgett's mother became concerned when her daughter did not respond to her calls, prompting her to go to Jesse's bedroom. What she discovered was a scene of horror and devastation. Blodgett's mother, in a state of shock, immediately called 911, reporting that her daughter had been strangled to death. The evidence of a violent struggle was undeniable, and investigators soon found themselves piecing together the puzzle of what had transpired. As they dug deeper, they discovered what they believed to be signs of the murder tossed in a trash can at a nearby park. Authorities found a cereal box that was packed with ropes used in the murder bloody sanitizing wipes, and a tape, which were confirmed to have both Jesse and Bartelt's DNA. Daniel Bartelt had once dated Jesse before the two ended up as close friends, but the shocking revelations did not end there. As investigators delved into Bartelt's life, they stumbled upon a disturbing piece of evidence. Articles about serial killers were found on Bartelt's computer, raising concerns about his mindset and potential for future violence. These findings added another layer of darkness to an already chilling case. The trial that followed was a harrowing experience for all involved. The courtroom was filled with tension as the prosecution presented their case against Bartelt. The evidence was overwhelming, leaving little room for doubt. Bartelt faced four felony charges, including two counts of first-degree intentional homicide, one count of first-degree recklessly endangering safety, and one count of false imprisonment. The charge of first-degree intentional homicide was directly related to Blodgett's death, while the other three charges stemmed from an alleged attack at Richfield Park on July 12th. As the judge handed down the sentence of life in prison without parole, the weight of Bartelt's crimes finally sank in. The courtroom fell silent, and Bartelt's fate was sealed. He would spend the rest of his life behind bars, never to experience freedom again. Bartelt's reaction to his sentencing was a mix of defiance and denial. Looking directly at Jesse Blodgett's family members, he addressed them with a sense of resignation. I have a disgustingly innate 
ability to lie to myself that I've exercised far too many times in my life. But I refuse to hurt someone other than myself by doing that. He went on to say, Buck Joy, I can't give you the reasons you are looking for. There's no hiding from yourself in a tiny concrete cell. This jumpsuit that I'm wearing, these shackles don't make me guilty. I know there's evidence that I can't refute that would make you believe that I am guilty. His words were met with a heavy silence as the Blodgett family absorbed the weight of his statement. Bartelt's refusal to take responsibility for his actions only added to their pain and frustration. Although he appeared tearful, Bartelt was able to contain his emotion after the life sentence was handed down. Conrad Schaefer. If two people were killed in those 2013 shootings when the suspect was only 15 years old. Investigators say Conrad Schaefer took part in nearly two dozen shootings. Now he'll be spending the rest of his life behind bars. It was a summer that would forever be etched in the memory of the residents of Kissimmee, Florida. A picturesque town known for its charm and tranquility, it became the backdrop for a series of unimaginable horrors. At the center of it all was Conrad Schaefer, a seemingly ordinary teenager whose actions would send shock shockwaves through the community. In the summer of 2013, the St. Cloud and other parts of Osceola County were plagued by a wave of violence that seemed to come out of nowhere. Two dozen shootings leaving a trail of fear and devastation in their wake. The peaceful streets turned into a battleground and the residents were left trembling in fear. The details of these crimes were nothing short of chilling. Schaefer, only 15 years old at the time, embarked on a rampage that would forever stain the community. His actions were calculated, his intentions sinister. No one was safe from his wrath. Tragically, two lives were lost as a result of Schaefer's heinous acts. The first victim, 17-year-old David Guerrero, was simply on his way to work on June 26, 2013, when he encountered Schaefer's malevolence. In a senseless act of violence, Schaefer fatally shot Guerrero, robbing him of his future and leaving his family shattered. But the horrors didn't end there. Just days later, Schaefer and three of his friends broke into the home of Eric Rupnarin, a 22-year-old hardworking man who never saw it coming. The peaceful sanctuary of his home turned into a nightmare as Schaefer mercilessly took Rupnarin's life by shooting him and then his accomplices slit Rupnarin's throat. The level of brutality displayed by Schaefer and his accomplices was beyond comprehension. The community was left in a state of shock and disbelief. How could a teenager, someone who should be filled with hope and dreams, commit such heinous acts? Authorities soon uncovered a chilling detail that added another layer of horror to the story. Schaefer had convinced his own father to purchase a gun and ammunition for him. This weapon, meant to protect, became a tool of destruction in the hands of a troubled teenager. The courtroom was filled with tension as the trial of Conrad Schaefer unfolded. The community, still reeling from the shock of his crimes, awaited the moment when justice would be served. Schaefer, now 18 years old, stood before the judge, his fate hanging in the balance. Finally, the moment arrived. The judge, his voice firm, delivered the sentence that would shape Schaefer's future. Two consecutive life sentences, a decision that sent shockwaves through the courtroom. The weight of the punishment hung heavy in the air, a reflection of the magnitude of Schaefer's crimes. Schaefer's reaction was a mix of disbelief and resignation. Nation. The reality of spending the rest of his life behind bars sank in, and the weight of his actions became even more apparent. The courtroom fell silent as he processed the gravity of his sentence. Jennifer Mee. The sound echoes through the TIA terminal, announcing the arrival of 15-year-old Jennifer Mee. Next, we uncover the shocking story of Jennifer Mee, also known as the Hiccup Girl. In this section, we will delve into the events that led to Jennifer's involvement in a heinous crime that would forever change her life. It all began in 2007 when Jennifer Mee gained international fame for her uncontrollable hiccups. The media couldn't get enough of her story, and she made appearances on numerous television shows, desperately searching for a cure. Jennifer claimed to be hiccuping an astonishing 50 times a minute, and her condition became a viral sensation. Jennifer tried everything to stop her hiccups. From ingesting sugar and peanut butter to breathing in a bag and even having people scare her, she was willing to try anything. But it wasn't until she received treatment from Dr. Bob Lind that her hiccups finally ceased. With her hiccups no longer a constant presence in her life, Jennifer's story took a dark turn in 2010. She became involved in a crime that shocked the nation and left everyone questioning how someone who had once been in the spotlight could end up in such a tragic situation. Jennifer met a man online and invited him to a vacant home where two of her friends were waiting. 
shocking. What was supposed to be a meeting turned into a horrifying ordeal. The man was robbed, shot, and killed. Jennifer, along with her two friends, was arrested and charged with murder as an accomplice to the crime. The details of the crime were chilling, and the nation was left in disbelief. How could someone who had experienced fame and media attention be involved in such a violent act? The media and the public were captivated by Jennifer's transformation from a media darling to a suspected criminal. During the trial, Jennifer's lawyer offered her a plea deal, but she rejected it. The prosecution presented compelling evidence, including a recording of a jailhouse phone call where Jennifer admitted to setting everything up, although she claimed she didn't kill anyone. Hi, Mama. Hello, Jennifer. What's going on? Why are you in jail? Who did you kill? I didn't kill nobody. Well, then how are they charging you with attempted murder? Because I said it. Experts testified that Jennifer's DNA was found on the victim's shirt, further linking her to the crime. Jennifer's defense argued that she suffered from schizophrenia and that her hiccups were a symptom of Tourette's syndrome. They painted a picture of a troubled young woman who was not fully responsible for her actions. However, the jury ultimately found Jennifer guilty of first-degree murder. Be the jury finds as follows, defendant in this case, defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged. The courtroom was filled with tension as the judge announced the verdict. Jennifer was found guilty of murder in the first degree as charged. The weight of her sentence, life in prison without parole, hung heavy in the air. Jennifer's co-defendants received the same sentence, emphasizing the severity of their actions. Jennifer's reaction to the verdict was a mix of disbelief, sadness, and resignation. The reality of spending the rest of her life behind bars sank in. Her dreams of a future filled with fame and success were shattered replaced by the harsh reality of life in prison. And with that, Jennifer's life took a tragic turn. The once famous hiccup girl was now a convicted murderer, facing a lifetime of confinement. The nation was left stunned by her fall from grace and the devastating consequences of her choices. TJ Lane. In a small town in Ohio, a shocking incident unfolded that would forever change the lives of those involved. On February 27, 2012, Thomas Michael T.J. Lane, a teenager filled with anger and resentment, carried out a tragic shooting at Chardon High School. This act of violence, fueled by a personal rivalry with one of his victims, left three students dead and several others injured. On that fateful morning as students settled into their classrooms, the atmosphere was tense. Unbeknownst to them, T.J. Lane had arrived at school armed with a .22 caliber handgun and a knife, ready to unleash his rage. As the minutes ticked by, the stage was set for a tragedy that would forever change the lives of those involved. The cafeteria, a bustling hub of activity, was the setting for the first act of violence. T.J. Lane, fueled by his personal vendetta, targeted Daniel Parmertor and opened fire. The sound of gunshots echoed through the air, shattering the tranquility of the school. Chaos ensued as students and staff scrambled to find safety, their lives forever altered in an instant. As the panic spread, Lane continued his rampage firing indiscriminately at anyone in his path. Russell King Jr. and Demetrius Hewlin were caught in the crossfire and fell victim to Lane's wrath. The hallways, once filled with laughter and chatter, now echoed with screams of terror and despair. In the midst of the chaos, some students managed to find refuge in their classrooms, barricading the doors and praying for their lives. Teachers, acting with bravery and quick thinking, did their best to protect their students from the unfolding nightmare. But the damage had already been done. Three lives were lost, and the scars of that day would forever haunt the survivors. In the aftermath of the shooting, the injured were rushed to nearby hospitals, their wounds a painful reminder of the senseless violence that had unfolded. Families anxiously awaited news of their loved ones, praying for their recovery and grappling with the unimaginable grief of losing a child. As the shockwaves of the shooting reverberated through the community, the legal system began its pursuit of justice. T.J. Lane, the perpetrator of this heinous act, was arrested and later indicted on multiple charges, including aggravated murder. The stage was set for a trial that would determine the fate of this troubled teenager. The courtroom was filled with anticipation as the trial began, the eyes of the nation fixed on this small town and the events that had unfolded within its walls. That was where T.J. Lane displayed a high level of disrespect and unremorsefulness for the heinous crime he had committed. First, he came into the courtroom wearing a shirt inscribed with the word killer across it. He also showed his contempt by smirking smugly when one of the victim's mother delivered her impact statement. You will never, ever be in my thoughts after this. Never. My family will move on, not you.
After weeks of testimony and deliberation, the moment of truth arrived. T.J. Lane, now facing the consequences of his actions, awaited the verdict that would seal his fate. The tension in the courtroom was palpable as the jury delivered their decision. T.J. Lane was found guilty on all counts. The courtroom erupted in a mix of emotions, relief, grief, and a sense of closure. The families of the victims, though forever scarred by their loss, found solace in the knowledge that justice had been served. Lane was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, ensuring that he would never again walk the streets as a free man. Despite the heavy sentence, T.J. Lane proved he didn't care as he showed a middle finger to the bereaved family saying, this hand that pulled the trigger that killed your sons now masturbates to the memory. Fuck all of you. Nehemiah Grigo. Tonight we are learning more disturbing details of a mass murder in Albuquerque, South Valley. A 15-year-old Nehemiah Griego is in jail after telling investigators he shot and killed his parents and three younger siblings. Next, we will explore the chilling case of Nehemiah Griego, a teenager whose life took a dark and tragic turn. From the horrifying details of the mass shooting that shook South Valley, New Mexico, leaving five family members dead to the gripping trial that followed, where Griego's fate hung in the balance. This was a case that held the nation spellbound. On that fateful day, 15-year-old old Grigo's dark thoughts manifested into a horrifying plan. Armed with a .22 caliber semi-automatic rifle and an AR-15 type semi-automatic rifle, Grigo set his plan into motion. He started by targeting his mother, Sarah, the first victim of his calculated rampage. The next target was Grigo's younger brother, whose life was cut short by the same hands that should have protected him. Grigo's actions were chillingly methodical as he moved through the house, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. But Grigo's spree of violence was far from over. He turned his attention to his two younger sisters, extinguishing their innocent lives in a matter of moments. The Griego family, once filled with laughter and love, was now shattered by tragedy. Griego's final target was his father, Greg, a former pastor and chaplain to the Albuquerque Fire Department. As Greg returned home, unaware of the horror that awaited him, Griego unleashed a hail of bullets, ending his father's life in a brutal act of violence. With his family members lying lifeless around him, Griego's actions took an even more disturbing turn. He loaded the two rifles into his van and drove to church, where he encountered his girlfriend. Griego spun a web of lies, telling her that his family had died in an accident. However, the pastor of the church became suspicious of Griego's story and immediately contacted emergency services. Griego's web of deception began to unravel as the truth slowly came to light. The magnitude of his heinous acts was revealed, leaving the community in shock and disbelief. During the subsequent investigation, Griego confessed to his crimes, revealing the depths of his despair and the twisted thoughts that had consumed him. He admitted to obtaining the guns used in the shooting from his parents' closet, a chilling detail that added another layer of horror to the already devastating story. The courtroom was filled with tension and emotion as Grigo stood before the judge, his fate hanging in the balance. Judge Alyssa Hart, presiding over the case, faced the daunting task of balancing the need for justice with the potential for rehabilitation. She acknowledged the severity of Grigo's crimes, the lives he had taken, and the pain he had caused. The judge recognized that Grigo needed to be held accountable for his actions, which he did by apologizing to his family members in court. I'm sorry for taking our parents and our sins. You know, I wish I could take it back. Reality is that we can. In her decision, Judge Hart handed down a sentence that aimed to balance the best interests of the community and the defendant. Grigo was sentenced to three concurrent life sentences for the murders of his brother and sisters. Grigo had already served almost seven years, and due to the concurrent nature of his life sentences, there was a possibility of parole in 30 years. It was a sentence that reflected the severity of his crimes, while allowing for the potential for redemption in the distant future. As the judge delivered her decision, Grigo's reaction, although had to gauge, appeared to be a mix of emotions. The weight of his actions and the consequences he now faced were evident in his slumped shoulders. Griego, now in his early 20s, would spend the majority of his life behind bars before he had a chance at freedom. Willard Miller. Meet Willard Miller, a name that will forever be etched in. Infamy. It all started innocently enough with Willard being your average high school junior, but little did anyone know he was harboring a dark secret, a plan that would shatter lives and send shockwaves through the community. Willard, along with friend Jeremy Goodale, decided to launch an attack on their Spanish teacher, Nohima Graber, after a bad grade. According to prosecutors, Willard had met with Mrs. Graber at Fairfield High School on November 2nd, 2021, to complain that she was lowering his grade. Seeing that nothing had changed, Willard, along 
along with Goodale decided to learn her routine, especially where she went for her daily afternoon walks. The details of their plan were sinister and calculated, showing a level of malice that is hard to comprehend. The duo ambushed Graber and beat her to death with a bat. Her body was found in a park hidden under a tarp where there were wheelbarrows and railroad ties. She had died from inflicted trauma to the head. The news of Williard's crime sent shockwaves through the halls of his high school. Students and teachers alike were left reeling, struggling to comprehend how someone they knew could commit such a heinous act. The sense of betrayal and fear was palpable as the community grappled with the realization that evil can lurk in the most unexpected places. The trial that followed was a harrowing spectacle as the prosecution laid out the damning evidence against Williard. Finally, the moment arrived when Williard would face the consequences of his actions. The judge, with a stern expression, delivered the verdict that would seal his fate. The court finds based on the nature and circumstances of this offense, along with the required 25 factors that I need to consider in sentencing a juvenile in the state of Iowa for murder in the first degree, that the defendant, Willard Noble Chaden Miller, should be sentenced to life Williard's reaction to the sentencing was nothing short of shocking. As the judge's words echoed through the courtroom, his face, although unreadable, gave a hint of remorse. The realization that he would spend the majority of his life behind bars seemed to hit him like a ton of bricks. Peyton Gendron. Peyton Gendron, a seemingly ordinary teenager, harbored a dark and twisted ideology that would ultimately lead to one of the most horrifying acts of violence in Buffalo's history. Otherwise assumed to be a quiet person, what many didn't know was that Gendron was a white supremacist, fueled by a toxic mix of hatred, fear, and ignorance. In the weeks leading up to the attack, Gendron's online presence became increasingly disturbing. He posted manifestos and hate-filled rants, outlining his white supremacist views and his plan to carry out a Massacre. These posts served as a chilling warning of the violence that was about to unfold. On the fateful day of the shooting, Gendron donned bullet-resistant armor and armed himself with a modified semi-automatic rifle. He entered a Topps-friendly market supermarket in Buffalo, New York, a predominantly black neighborhood, and his victims, unsuspecting and innocent, had no idea of the horror that awaited them. The rampage that ensued was swift and merciless. Gendron unleashed a hail of bullets, indiscriminately targeting anyone who crossed his path. The sound of gunshots echoed through the supermarket aisles, shattering the peace and tranquility that once filled the space. Panic and chaos ensued as shoppers desperately sought shelter and tried to escape the carnage. When the shooting finally ceased, the devastating toll became clear. Ten African Americans lay lifeless, their lives cut short by an act of senseless violence. Three others were left injured, their bodies and minds forever scarred by the traumatic experience. Gendron's actions sent shockwaves through the community, leaving a trail of grief and despair in their wake. As the investigation unfolded, the extent of Gendron's radicalization and premeditation became apparent. The evidence gathered from his online presence and the meticulous planning he undertook left no doubt that this was a hate-fueled act of domestic terrorism. The trial of Peyton Gendron, the teenager responsible for the Buffalo mass shooting, gripped the nation as the community sought justice for the lives lost. The courtroom was filled with tension and emotion as the families of the victims faced their loved one's killer, demanding accountability for the pain and devastation he had caused. After careful consideration, the judge delivered the sentence that would forever alter Gendron's future. They emphasized that there was no place for his ideologies in a civilized society and that there could be no mercy or understanding for his actions. Gendron was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The damage you have caused is too great, and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. As Gendron heard the judge's words, his face remained impassive. It was unclear whether he truly comprehended the magnitude of his actions or the lifelong consequences he would face. The weight of his sentence settled upon him, a heavy burden that he would carry for the rest of his days. Nicholas Lindsay. Nicholas Lindsay, born on January 18, 1995 in Florida, had a troubled history long before the tragic events unfolded. Lindsay's criminal record included nonviolent offenses such as grand theft and trespassing. These brushes with the law hinted at a troubled young man spiraling down a dangerous path. Lindsay's Facebook page, a window into his troubled world, revealed a darker side. It showcased his affiliation with a gang, as evidenced by his chosen name. This connection to a criminal organization hinted at a deeper involvement in a world of violence and 
and crime. On February 21, 2011, Officer David Crawford, a dedicated law enforcement officer from the St. Petersburg Police Department, responded to a call of a suspicious person. Little did he know that this routine call would be his last. Officer Crawford, a respected member of the community, approached the scene with caution, unaware of the danger that awaited him. As he neared the location, a series of gunshots rang out, piercing the tranquility of the neighborhood. Officer Crawford was shot and killed, his life cut short in the line of duty. The community was left devastated by the loss of a dedicated officer who had served and protected them with unwavering commitment. The shooting of Officer Crawford sent shockwaves through the community, which had already experienced other recent law enforcement deaths. The loss of yet another officer intensified the grief and fear that gripped the city. The community's determination to seek justice led to a swift arrest. Tips from concerned citizens led the police to Nicholas Lindsay's location the day after the shooting. Lindsay was apprehended and taken into custody, where he eventually confessed to the crime. I thought it was on safety, but it wasn't. And I pulled it out on my finger on the chair. The trial of Nicholas Lindsay, charged with the first-degree murder of Officer David Crawford, captivated the nation. The courtroom was filled with tension as the prosecution and defense presented their cases, each side fighting for their version of justice. The prosecution painted a chilling picture of the events that unfolded on that fateful day. They presented compelling evidence, showcasing Lindsay's troubled past and his escalating criminal history. The jury listened intently as the prosecution built a strong case against him. After careful deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. Nicholas Lindsay was found guilty of first-degree murder, a conviction that would have severe consequences for the young man. As the judge pronounced the life sentence, the courtroom was filled with a heavy silence. All eyes turned to Nicholas Lindsay, awaiting his reaction to the life-altering verdict, and what unfolded left everyone in the courtroom stunned. Instead of showing remorse or regret, Lindsay grinned. A chilling smile spread across his face, sending shivers down the spines of those present. His lack of remorse only reinforced the belief held by many, including Officer Crawford's daughter, Amanda, that Lindsay was nothing more than a monster. John Freeman Jr. It is 22 years to life for this teenage killer who murdered a little girl. Today, 17-year-old John Freeman learned how long he'll serve in prison for the death of five-year-old Isabella Tennant. Now, little Bella was just weeks away from starting kindergarten when her life was stolen. Finally, we delve into the tragic case of John Freeman Jr., a teenager whose life took a dark turn when he was sentenced to 22 years to life in prison for the murder of five-year-old Isabella Tennant. Brace yourself as we uncover the chilling details of this crime and the courtroom drama that unfolded. It was a sunny summer day when Isabella, affectionately known as Bella, was just weeks away from starting kindergarten. Little did her family know that this day would mark the beginning of a nightmare they could never have imagined. According to authorities, the 17-year-old Freeman brutally murdered the young girl at her great-grandparents' home in Niagara Falls in August 2012. Isabella Tennant was spending the night there while her mother was at work. Freeman at that time was a neighbor of the homeowners, who said they left the girl in his care when they went to bed. According to the police, Freeman confessed that he choked Isabella to death with his bare hands because she was refusing to sleep. Investigators say after murdering her, Freeman disposed of Isabella's body in a garbage container with the help of his 18-year-old friend, Tyler Best. The courtroom was filled with emotion as the judge, lawyers, and families involved grappled with the devastating impact of this case. John Freeman Jr., the 17-year-old responsible for Bella's untimely demise, sat in the defendant's chair, his face etched with guilt and remorse. As the sentencing approached, all eyes were on Freeman. Would he show any sign of remorse? Would he attempt to explain his actions? The tension in the room was palpable. The judge, Matthew Murphy, recognized the severity of the crime committed against young Isabella. With a heavy heart, he handed down the maximum sentence, ensuring that Freeman would spend the next 22 years of his life behind bars. Freeman's demeanor throughout the proceedings was visibly distraught, tears streaming down his face as he grappled with the weight of his actions. As we come to the end of this thought-provoking journey, into the world of teenagers reacting to life sentences, we hope these stories have shed light on the complexities of the justice system and human nature as well. For more fascinating videos like this, click on the cards showing on your screens and I'll be waiting on the other side.